Thank you. I just want to set the scene for South Australia before I talk about infrastructure. Um, as you can see, we're leading by a long way in, in the amount of um, renewable energy capacity compared to the rest of the South Australian, uh, Australian states. And most of that's wind, and mostly the financial driver has been the renewable energy target that um, Andrew talked about previously. I also want to show you this slide because it shows that unlike a lot of emerging technologies, um, the cost goes down with deployment. Uh, we talked about low-hanging fruit, and that's what's happened in the wind industry. So, in fact, this, this prediction is that the cost of wind with uh, installed capacity will go up because we're looking at those more remote sites that need a bit more um, finances to, to make them viable. So that then brings on the next slide. <laughs> Am I pointing the right direction? Got it. Okay. So um, I want to talk to you about a study that we have recently commissioned, and this is the results of the study. And um, again, um, Andrew talked a lot about the Air Peninsula and what a great wind resource it is, but there are constraints with bringing that energy to the market. So we did um, a study called the Green Grid Study and we looked at Air Peninsula and we looked at what the wind resource was there and what the potential was for development in that area. We then undertook a um, multi-criteria analysis of that, that wind resource and we looked at um, land use, we looked at vegetation, we looked at um, native species, uh, slope and so on. And we came up with uh, still some key areas that were suitable for wind development. And one of the big pluses of this area too is that the population density is quite low. And so the not in my backyard syndrome is, is perhaps a bit less in this area than in other areas in Australia. So there are four wind zones that we identified as being um, really good places for wind development. And uh, they have greater than eight metres per second uh, wind. And they also have greater than 38% capacity factor, which is a, a really good result for anyone wanting to develop wind. Um, there's a potential <coughs> in all of Air Peninsula for 10,000 megawatts of capacity where we decided to look at 2,000 megawatts of capacity initially for stage one of the development. And there are four developers already there in Air Peninsula saying, right, we've got land. We, we know there's a good resource here. We want to actually build a wind farm, but we can't because there's no transmission infrastructure in place to be able to get that electricity out to, to everyone else who, who needs to use it. So there are transmission constraints and, and how do we um, deal with those? So typically what happens now in Australia um, is that a developer will go to the transmission network service provider and in South Australia that's Electronet and they'll say, right, I've got a spot here, I want to build my wind farm. Uh, can you connect me? And the Electronet will say, yep, sure, that'll cost you this much. Now, in the case of Air Peninsula, if we connect up some of those zones that are, are very prospective for wind, and if we look at that, um, the, the heavy line, uh, that's stage one of, of what we're talking about. So you can see there's, there's a long distance between Port Augusta, which is up the top there, and Elliston on the west coast there. And if, if a developer on the west coast, for instance, came to Electronet and said, right, well, I, I want to connect, um, that would cost $613 million. Now, I don't believe a developer would say, yep, that's great, we can afford that, we'll, we'll build it and we'll build all that infrastructure. So there needs to be another way of being able to um, make this a business proposition. So what happened was the Australian Energy Market Commission was asked by the um, federal government to have a look at their national electricity rules to say, well, you know, climate change is happening, we've got more renewable energy, we've got the renewable energy target that's being increased. What, what needs to happen to be able to connect some of this remote generation? And, and th there's similar issues with solar. So solar, for instance, in South Australia is up the north of the state 
and, and we're down the south. So we need to be able to connect these remote um, resources without that financial impost on, on developers because they just won't happen otherwise. So the Australian Energy Market Commission came up with an idea, it's not regulated yet, an idea of a scale efficient network extension. So that's um, shorthand is SENI. So the SENI idea is that instead of that bilateral arrangement with a developer and, and Electronet, um, in this case, it can be more of a collaborative approach. So a developer can say to Electronet, look, I'm, I'm really interested in the Air Peninsula, I've got this spot over here. And Electronet said, great, let's advertise, let's see what other developers are interested in the area. And in that way, um, the costs are spread. So we're still talking about $613 million, but instead of that now having to be paid up front, there's now also a mechanism within this rule, if it's passed, for generators to pay a yearly fee for the use of that transmission infrastructure, and rather than having to pay that all up front. And, and then um, it, that kind of works. And there are four developers on the Air Peninsula who are keen to develop this area and this area as a stage one of, of the green grid. They've got 2,000 megawatts of capacity of, of wind generation potential and they're happy to pay what that annual fee would be. So it can happen, but we need that um, rule change to happen. Now, that's just one part of the equation though, because that's just taking energy up to Port Augusta. Then we get into trouble again. Because um, as one of the previous speakers said, the, the grid is starting to get constrained in places already. Um, I've certainly seen modeling that suggests it can take some more wind power, depending on where it is, but it can't take 2,000 megawatts of intermittent wind capacity from Air Peninsula the way it is at the moment. So we need some other augmentation of that shared network. So um, the Green Grid study also looked at what else would need to happen to be able to bring this renewable energy to the market. And they suggested we needed an augmentation of that backbone of our electricity grid, an augmentation of the um, infrastructure that sends the electricity to the eastern states so that we could actually become a net exporter of renewable energy because we, we don't have enough industry to use that amount of, of electricity in South Australia. So we need to export it and we need to upgrade the grid to do that. And that's going to cost uh, around $800 million. So we're, we're talking, you know, big money, how, how does that happen? Now, um, because Electronet is a monopoly, they can't just go out and say, yep, we'll do that, no worries, because we will pay for it. We pay for any infrastructure upgrade. So to stop them doing that, um, there needs to be checks and balances, and, and the check and balance that's in existence at the moment is a, a market regulatory test. So every time Electronet needs to, uh, wants to upgrade, a piece of the transmission network, they need to show that there's a market benefit for what they're doing. Now, the, the people who did the Green Grid study for us, which was a consortium of Macquarie Capital, Wally Parsons and Baker and McKenzie, they believe that this upgrade will actually pass a market benefits test. So, um, so basically, this can happen, this Green Grid, as long as those national electricity rules passed and then South Australia can become a um, exporter of renewable energy and that can become a, a new industry for us. So thank you. Thank you Catherine. Um, I've got a question and then we'll open it up for discussion with the, with the, with the audience. Um, other states are richer than, uh, than our state and can afford to subsidize their renewable energy generation. But why do you think we are ahead of them? Is it simply because we have favorable conditions or is it simply just policy? Um, well, the, you could argue that we have a really good planning environment in South Australia as well. And, and certainly developers that I've talked to have said, South Australia is great if you want to get um, some infrastructure project up like a wind farm. We've, we don't have the dense population and we have a planning environment that might take you know, six to eight months to get approval. Um, there are 
uh, wind farms I know of in Victoria who are three years down the track and they still haven't got approval. Three years costs a lot more money from a developer perspective than, than six to nine months. So um, that's, I think, one of the big reasons why we've attracted the, the wind farm development in South Australia. The other question I have is um, the major consumption of uh, electricity in South Australia is really the mineral industry and they mainly concentrate it sort of in the north of the state as far as I know. Uh, shouldn't be we are concentrating on there and, and then sort of um, augment the rest of it in here? Um, well I guess um, you're referring to probably the Olympic Dam expansion project which, which hasn't got approval yet um, at the yeah. moment. We, um, as a state, are um, providing, we, we have the energy um, to match the, the load. Um, so anything extra, we need to, to send off um, interstate. So, so that, that's the equation, I think. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, I'd like to um, ask the panel one more question before actually I give you the opportunity to ask questions. And that is, uh, do you think that in the foreseeable future, Australia would move to 100% renewable energy? If we were very rich. <laughs> we are rich. <laughs> Andrew? Um, <clears throat> I think Wes also touched on this. I think ultimately what we'll have are a combination of energy sources. And while we are transitioning to lower carbon intensity, I think that combination and that historical investment we've had will we'll continue to use it. Um, <clears throat> although, if the uh, pressures from uh, the public are such that the public wants to see more renewables, then I think governments will respond to that, and I think industry will respond to that, the suppliers. So, to some extent, ultimately, it will come down to what consumers want. Uh, generally, that's how our society works. Um, the people lead the governments and the governments uh, and industry then follow. Uh, I'll, I'll make a comment there too that, that when setting um, policy as government, and, and I agree with you, I think you know if public wants more renewable energy then governments respond to that. We also have to be careful that we don't leave certain um, people on the margins out of the equation. So. It, uh, renewable energy just costs a lot more money and um, we can do it but everyone will be paying more for it so um, it depends you know what percentage we want and what percentage more we want to pay on our electricity bill as to how much we undertake that uh, ultimately technically it, it could could happen um, um, but it would be a matter of uh, the imperatives being in place but um, uh, and the cost would, would be a big one because there's a law of diminishing returns that as you uh, um, contribute more from, um, from from variable sources, you need uh, you know, significantly more capital to uh, iron out that, whether it's by way of uh, computers, smart grids, sto active storage, whatever it may be. So the two go together. Okay. One more last question is um, we have a target uh, of 45,000 gigawatt hour by 2020. My question to you, how are we tracking? Are we going to get there? No, I, I, I'm confident just in the way that uh, the nation and, and industry responded when we set a lower target. I don't see there's any reason why that, that target won't be met. Uh, I might comment on bo both of these questions because uh, energy production is directly related to the economic growth of the country. Uh, when we say that we want to be 100% on renewables, probably we could ask ourselves, why? Do we need to do that? Do we need to reduce the economic growth of the country, just paying for the electricity? And why we cannot just ship that, that into some other area in order to just continue economic growth? And, uh, and then probably later on, when technology more developed, we could just move toward the 100% of renewable energy, while uh, probably production of energy is very important if you want to keep growth of the economy as we are doing now. Well, people argue there's a need to reduce CO2 and that uh, if we don't do it soon, then this is what the incentives are. Yeah, we reduce it, but we don't have to just cut it. We could just reduce it by 100%. Uh, 
Uh, um, uh, I, I think that that, that 20 per cent's probably been struck at around about the right level. Uh, mm. Remember that um, power generation is not like electronics. It, it takes a long time to, a long lead time to get these, um, these sorts of megawatts uh, on the ground uh, or in the air. And um, uh, you're going to see uh, at the moment, it, it's going to look like a fairly flat curve. And I think by 2019, 2018, 2019, it'll be, uh, everyone will be scrabbling. Okay, that's a good time to open the uh, uh, the session for uh, for the floor for discussion. Uh, there's a question there. The gentleman, uh, I've been putting his hand up for a while. Yeah. Um, there was some slight mention of geothermal power. I know that Origin Energy is a significant investor of geothermal. There was a technical issue about the temperature uh, of the water coming to the well head. Is that what the problem of why that doesn't assume a bigger part in your plan? Or is it a technical issue to do with the steel they put down the hole or something? I mean, what we have huge reserves of it. Do you want me to? Um, uh, yes, just a minute. Uh, uh, although this is uh, this is not our topic, but quickly, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say that if you're interested in that answer, probably the next session I think is the one to come to. <laughs> um, <coughs> but I mean, one thing I, I perhaps touched on in my talk, and it's worth remembering, is that, uh, and as Wes showed with the steam cycle. Um, these developments take a long time to, uh, often new technologies take a long time to uh, develop to the industrial scale. And while geothermal energy <coughs> globally has had a long history, principally in volcanic regions, um, what we're doing in South Australia through companies like Geodynamics and Origin and Petrotherm and others is new. And it's perhaps not surprising that some of the challenges there are being seen because it's very new technology in a global sense. But probably the next session is the one to come to. It is, it is a huge reserve uh, resource, but um, that's what we call future technologies. Or other questions, please. Um, I guess in a way it's possibly more a comment. Um, it was to Mazia. Uh, the propeller noise, uh, submarine technology is always slightly the very quiet propellers. Um, all very secret, I suppose, but they strange shapes. And the other thing is the vortices. Um, golf balls have pimples. Uh, my husband worked in uh, upper atmosphere research, discovered that when you actually uh, scour the nose cone rather than have it shiny, the whole thing went a lot, the lead rock went a lot further. So perhaps some of these things of straight propellers, yeah. the noise, it might be something else, uh, or even to break vortices up, like they do on aircraft. So some of those other areas I thought just might make a bit of impact. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for that. Question to Andrew. I know two families have got photovoltaics on their roofs and they have no idea whether they're making money, breaking even or losing money. They just get the run around from the company that supplies it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a comment? Um, no comments. <laughs> look, I mean, look, I don't know which company, and I'm not going to probably comment on the detail, but um, you should be able to get in your bill, uh, if you've got solar on your roof, an amount that shows the net export. The way it works in South Australia is that if you put solar on your roof, it's the net export that you get paid for um, uh, at a premium through the feed law. Um, so if you have a household where um, the household goes out during the day, everyone works, the kids go to school. Um, you should do quite well out of it. If you perhaps uh, have a household where everyone's at home during the day or the swimming pool pump's running, you probably won't see much benefit at all. Um, as to the performance of different retail companies and or people selling PV, it's probably something to take up with them. Please. Um, perhaps a stupid question, but in solar power, we're talking about the ability to store the electricity for six hours versus 24 or however uh, many. Can you elaborate on this? How is it stored and why is there a difference between six hours and 24? Um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, uh, in the, the, the concentrating solar power station technology, where we'd be storing it as thermal energy rather than electricity. Uh, so you have your, your solar collectors, 
they make a hot fluid, you know, maybe 400 degrees. That heat is stored. Um, with a, and, and this is where a lot of the, the development is at the moment, is to find the sort of fluid that's going to best store that heat uh, for long periods of time. But at the moment, molten salt um, is, is a very good one. Uh, that heat is stored at 400 degrees Celsius. And then when you want to generate steam to run your steam turbine, you simply flow your, your you have your steam uh, path working and your steam turbine generates electricity. Um, the, the cost issue is um, the fact that it's not just, of course, you need bigger tanks and bigger flow rates and um, you know a bigger inventory of, of the molten salt or whatever the fluid is um, for, for, for larger storage, but you also need more collector field um, because you've got to have something to, uh, to charge your, store, your, your storage fluid with. And so there's a, there's a two-pronged capital cost. Um, and it's a matter of balancing. In interestingly, um, yeah, there's a school of thought that uh, um, adding storage on may not reduce your levelised cost of electricity. It may even increase it slightly. But if you have control over when you generate your electrons and you can then generate your electrons at, um, at high um, tariff periods rather than at um, uh, maybe mid-morning when the tariffs are not so high, um, that extra capital cost pays for itself well and truly. Other questions? Yeah, about two and a half years ago, I think it was, there was a, a session a bit like this down at the University of Adelaide in the, in the Napier, part of, a, part of the greenhouse sessions, I think, and there was a, a speaker there who, I don't know who he was, but he was, a, he was an amazingly big, big picture thing, thing that we talked about, you know, for a, can cover the uh, size of a, the greatest cattle station in, in Central Australia with solar cells, you could, you could power a drain, etc. One of the things he did say was if you had a high speed, this is probably for you, Catherine, if you had a high speed interconnector power grid between Queensland and South Australia going out through the back area to capture potential solar sites in BG geothermal sites, the, the, the efficiency to be able to connect up those two grid systems would, 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 would probably have a benefit of something like a, a billion dollars a year or, or some, some phenomenal amount. Yeah, well, it is, and it's actually stage two of the green grid, which I didn't elaborate because we haven't as yet found a way to fund that. But stage two of the green grid looks at those resources north, looks at the solar potential, the geothermal potential, and looks at a way of carrying that to the east coast, as you said, on, on a, a DC connection. Um, very expensive connection. It would go nearly to Sydney um, from around Wilmington and uh, it's a you know great way for transporting um, energy but the, the cost issue in is that it probably wouldn't pass a markets benefit test that I talked about before and would have to be part of some kind of nation building scheme so but potentials there yeah yeah please uh, just just moving on from that, um, in the mining industry, people will go in and mine a resource and realistically not expect to make money for you know five years. Uh, why is this not approached in the same way? Like for example, with the grid, um, you know you create the grid and realistically you can hook into it and expect to make money uh, in the future. Why? Why is it sort of thrown around that it's expensive and too hard? But, um, well, I guess we're saying the green grid isn't too expensive. It can happen. We just need a rule change. So it's not too hard. It's, it's a great opportunity. We can do that. Um, as far as the um, that DC connection that I talked about for, for bringing um, online some of that northern scheme, um, we all pay for it. Um, at the moment, um, as I said before, uh, transmission network service provider has to pass this regulatory test to be able to, to build something like that. And if it doesn't pass, it needs to be funded some other way. Um, and so, yes, it can be done if there's enough will and enough money. So it, it is a cost uh, paradigm. Sure, please. I wonder if you could oh. say something about who controls these grids that transfer energy in all directions around the country. And 
is there any possibility of the whole thing uh, uh, bombing out and collapsing so that, like happened in, when New York uh, had a, a blackout that lasted 12 hours because the electricity system shut down? I'm just wondering if you could make a few comments on this. We've talked about wonderful technology, but I'm just concerned about the control and stability of the whole system. I'll, how about I start that one? Um, so whenever you do any network augmentation, there, there is a lot of reactive support that, that needs to be covered. So um, certainly the study that, that we did, we, we looked at all of that. So in every little part of, of the, the augmentation, it was looked at what, what could that line carry? Um, where would it trip out, like you're talking? Where, where would it you know, potentially black out the state? Um, what would happen if 2,000 megawatts in Air Peninsula of, of functioning wind power would suddenly drop out, which, which happens with wind, wind stops blowing, suddenly it stops. There needs to be some kind of reactive support there um, all along the line and certainly Electronet would never build something that didn't have that in place. And, and we've costed that as part of that study. Can I just extend this further and say, um, say here, in, here in Adelaide, if more and more people uh, did put PV on their roofs. Uh, is the existing infrastructure, can the existing infrastructure take this? Uh, is there any limit by which we say, no, we can't do it anymore because the system is upgrading first? Um, and how far are we? Yeah, I, I'm not sure I have enough information to, to answer that. I, I do know that, that PV to a certain point can stop having to, to pay more money to aug augment the, the network, but, but you're because right. Because it's there. distributed? Because it's distributed, but but you know if you have, for instance, a thousand homes all next to each other in in one suburb, who all have PV panels and they're all exporting their energy into the grid because it's a sunny day and no one's home, and then suddenly there's a cloud comes over, it it could be that 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 system needs some kind of the reactive support that I was talking about before. So, so that's definitely something that, that the network, would, in this case, that would be ETSA, would need to be looking into. Other questions, please, Dan? Uh, sh surely it's only polit political will that's uh, holding us back from developing a national, let's say, renew renewable energy source. Uh, like, I mean, governments have demonstrated, let's say, with our uh, telephone system, the road system, I mean, Manhattan Project and... Uh, let, let's say the uh, uh, sort of the, the moon project itself. I mean, the governments have, have even in, uh, indulged in that's a wars they could barely afford. So it really should be a government initiative, shouldn't it? <laughs> which, which one particular? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll start. I think um, uh, all over the world, I'm aware that I'm a, I'm a sort of pseudo government employee in a, in a caretaker period, so I'm going to be careful. But um, uh, um, all over the world, governments uh, are the ones who've had to take the lead on these things, whether it's been wind in Denmark 20 years ago, uh, PVs in Germany, Japan, um, etc., et and, and more recently, uh, solar thermal in, uh, in the US and um, Spain. Uh, but it's, it's not just political, it's also so dollars. And if you look at this... Uh, the solar flagships program uh, that's uh, just getting underway at the moment to, to build um, up to a, a thousand megawatts of solar power stations, both PV and concentrating solar power in Australia. Now, I think that it, it's a great thing. Um, there's, uh, you know, the government's had to put out one and a half billion dollars already towards that, and that's probably a third of the cost. Um, you might get another third of the cost from the sale of, of electricity. Um, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, maybe a, a carbon price eventually. But there's another third, you know, of the order of a billion dollars missing to build a thousand megawatts. Now, to put that in perspective, Australia's got something like 50,000 megawatts and a bit installed at the moment. So it, it, it's dollars as well as political will. Um, and the two need to, need to work together. If we wait um, long enough, the price is going to come down from overseas. And then we'll just buy it, and uh, and maybe we'll get some jobs to do some concreting or some metal bending or something or other. But uh, I'd like to think we could get in earlier than that. Other questions? In, in the top? Okay. Um, I guess uh, in terms of thinking critically about uh, renewable energy, the question I would ask is: Is it truly the answer? 
NASA to, to meet the challenge of reducing uh, fossil fuel use uh, in the current time frames that it's being said that it needs to be. Um, the, the example of Denmark and, uh, and Germany is also, of course, very hard for wind power, but they haven't actually successfully replaced one coal power station as of, as, as of yet. So, and it also seems like the general view is that you know there's lots of potential in the future for renewable power, but at, at the moment you know we're looking for breakthroughs, but we need to have um, fossil fuel back up for um, current developments in renewable energy. So I guess the question is that where would you see the potential for you know like major emissions cuts? I mean, to perhaps <clears throat> put, your, put your point in perspective, are there other ways to reduce emissions? And at the end of the day, the reason society um, wants to do this, um, and that's why governments respond, is because of the concern that is there uh, in society and from scientists around the impact that carbon emissions might have on the climate. Without wanting to take that any further than that, making that comment, that's why we're doing this uh, as a society. Um, and therefore, thinking about the size of the challenge, uh, if one thinks about the 5% reduction in emissions that we need to achieve, and I think both political parties have signed up to this by 2020, um, that's equivalent to not only the 7,000 megawatts of wind I talked about earlier uh, required to be built, but that needs to be doubled to 14,000 megawatts. You need to shut down probably the, for those that maybe viewing this on the web, uh, Victoria recently there was a talk about shutting down Hazelwood. Well you need to shut down Hazelwood and you need to shut down your lawn as well. So you need to replace those and that's why you need more wind. Um, plus every household and every industry in Australia has to reduce their domestic uh, and industry consumption of electricity through efficiency measures by 20%. So you, I guess at the end of the day for society to achieve substantial reductions in emissions intensity and ultimately how much CO2 we produce for what we live. We need to do a lot of things and we need to do them um, together. It's, there is no one single answer that provides a panacea here. So um, that's the challenge before us, I think. And the reality is that the economists would say, and there's debate about this too, but um, if we start sooner rather than later, we've got a better chance of um, achieving those outcomes. Uh, I guess the problem with the climate science is that there are a lot of lags in our system as an Earth. And it may be that by the time that, as in the broad society, is really concerned about what the implications might be, it may well be too late because um, the inventories in the system and the, and the inertia in the system will take it far beyond um, perhaps what's uh, makes it a world that's uh, a pleasant place to live in. I think with this uh, very thoughtful note, uh, perhaps we should uh, wrap this up. Uh, thank the panel uh, for their contribution and thank you for uh, attending and listening to this. Uh, please join with me in thanking the panel again.